We've had all sorts of new discoveries, the Bakken Field, the Eagle Ford, uh, developments in Colorado. And uh, most of these shale fields have uh, been discovered on private lands. And even though the number of permits on public lands has gone down, uh, the production on private lands has increased uh, monitored dramatic. closely the boom in energy production that is taking place in the United States, primarily on private and state lands. IER also tracks regulations and policies that limit the potential to reduce our dependence on overseas oil regimes, hinder our ability to generate much needed revenues, and harm efforts to foster an energy-based economic recovery that creates jobs. Just this morning, we released a study on the economic effect of immediately opening federal lands onshore and offshore to energy production. According to our analysis, immediately opening federal lands that are currently unavailable because of statutory or administrative action would result in an additional $14.4 trillion to our GDP over the next 37 years. In light of the recent Commerce Department report that GDP shrank for the first time since 2009, our economy needs the lasting stimulus that robust energy development on federal lands and waters would provide. But today's hearing is focused primarily on the resource availability and the potential under our feet and off our shores to achieve domestic energy goals, almost unthinkable just a few years ago. In fact, for decades, Americans were asking the question, where will we get the energy we need to heat our homes, fuel our cars, and meet the demands of a strong 21st century economy? Due to hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling technologies, we no longer question whether we have the resources. Rather, we question whether we will be able to develop them and thus reap the nationwide economic benefits such development would foster. The myth of energy scarcity that has plagued our national conversation has been exposed. Just in the last year, the misleading refrain that the U.S. only possesses 2 percent of the world's oil reserves has been replaced by the mounting evidence of our nation's resource abundance. IER highlighted this in an inventory of North America's energy resources. Using government information, we catalog the vast resources of the United States and our neighbors. The U.S. has enough resources to provide reliable and affordable energy for centuries to come. The question is whether the federal government will permit us to access these abundant resources and not whether sufficient resources exist. We can now unlock our shale resources using technology proven for more than 60 years in over one million wells without a single confirmed case of contamination. Furthermore, while our use of fossil energy has dramatically increased over the last 50 years, our air quality has improved. According to the EPA, emissions from the six criteria pollutants under the Clean Air Act have decreased 68 percent since 1970, even though our energy consumption has increased by 45 percent. Therefore, however, troubling trends in policy that threaten to restrict access to our vast energy resources energy resources, which could make American-made energy less available, affordable, and reliable. Oil shale development has all but stopped because administration policy withdrew research and much-needed leasing activity that could bring these resources to market. Increased oil sands imports from our neighbor Canada could free the U.S. from energy dependence in foreign countries where American workers face increasing threats of kidnapping by terrorists and even murder. But we need the transportation infrastructure to get it here and the energy security that this infrastructure would provide. Onshore development on federal lands, which is roughly estimated at 700 million acres of subsurface mineral estate, is extremely limited and is increasingly so. In fiscal 2009, for example, the current administration leased fewer onshore acres for energy development than in any preceding year on record. Offshore development on 1.76 billion acres of mineral lands has suffered from a de facto administration embargo, with lease plans canceled, moratoria imposed, and cumbersome re regulatory activity that served to discourage exploration. Today, permitting delays by Federal regulators have driven the wait to more than 300 days before drilling can begin on Federal lands, about twice as long as it took in 2005. By contrast, states like North Dakota are now turning permits in 10 days, in Ohio 14 days, in Colorado 27 days. Alaska's energy resources lie dormant, even though its pipeline has enough unused capacity to take twice the daily production of North Dakota. Decisions made today about access to energy resources affect energy production for years and decades to come. 
the more areas accessible to energy production today increases the likelihood of domestic production tomorrow, and with it, increased jobs, government revenues, and economic Ms. Hutzler, uh, because you specifically mentioned uh, production on federal lands versus non-federal lands, and it's one of the misnomers that we hear about up here in Washington. Uh, you know, and the president will go around saying uh, production's never been higher, and yet you actually look in some of his policies that have shut production off on federal lands in the areas where the federal government doesn't currently have the ability to go in and have an impact in those states where they're seeing uh, a real revolution. It's on non-federal lands. So if you can touch a little bit on that uh, about maybe some of the factors behind uh, such an increase on non-federal lands where you, where you actually have some problems, in some cases reductions on federal lands on production. Uh, production, uh, for instance, production of oil on um, private and state lands over the past five years has increased is is essentially 96 percent of the total production that we've gotten. And the reason generally is that there's a lot of red tape when you try to deal with production on federal lands. And I think I mentioned in my opening remarks and in my testimony that it takes over 300 days to now get a permit to uh, drill on federal lands, where in the states it's less than 30 days. So all of this is taking much um, longer for a company to invest uh, their money in terms of trying to, to deal with production on federal lands. And we can see, especially if, if you look at uh, the, the shale natural gas plays, uh, they're, they're actually regulated. You know, the EPA might try to give the impression uh, that, that there's no federal regulations and they need to step in. And I think that concerns a lot of people because the EPA doesn't have a good track record of implementing good regulations where states have actually done a, a really good job at regulating natural gas shale plays. And, and frankly, the 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 topography in Louisiana is a whole lot different than it is in Pennsylvania or North Dakota or Texas. And, and so the states have the ability to do that much better and, and have a great track record, by the way, of doing that. And, and so I think it's a good point to make because uh, where we've seen real growth and not only in, in energy but in jobs, uh, where, where you know you go to North Dakota, the lowest unemployment in the nation, uh, they have up there because of all of this new uh, economic growth coming from this technology, and so we surely don't want to see the federal government come in and try to slow that down in the name of, of good regulations when, in fact, you already have good regulations, but the way it's supposed to be done, and that is where Provide the Provide some is. clarity to something that we heard at this hearing, and we hear a lot. Uh, my good friend, Mr. Scalise, and he is my good friend, uh, had asked Ms. Uh, Hutzler uh, why we weren't seeing more development on federal lands, and, and her reply was that the permitting process takes up to 300 days. Uh, I want to put a map up on the screen that I think we have uh, that I think should provide a little bit of clarity. As you look at the United States, uh, that dark area, the gray shaded area, that, that's the federal lands, and the, the, the light red, the pinkish area, is where our oil and gas shell plays are. And then the dark red that you see is where there's an overlap of federal lands and oil and gas shell plays. And uh, Mr. Siminski, I think back in August, uh, you testified to this committee uh, that because basically the shell resource basins are largely outside of the federal lands, so too is the shell production. Uh, I think your quote was, in this case, the geology is working in favor of, of non-federal landowners. So uh, we hear this a lot that, you know, there's all this development that could be taking place on federal lands, but the permitting process is, is so bad. And I think the map pretty graphically illustrates that there's just not much federal lands where the oil and gas shell plays are in the United States. Um, I just wanted to Once provide that. Once you address your map again, and maybe that is the case for the shale uh, formations. But on the other hand, the federal government has a lot of non-shale-based areas that. It but could but be all the permitting. growth is in the. Sh I mean, the boom we're seeing right now is is happening because we figured out how to get this oil and gas out of shale. Well, let's take the offshore area in terms of oil drilling. We were uh, drilling a lot. As a matter of fact, the oil numbers offshore in FY 2010 were very high, but then it <clears throat> dropped by 17 percent. So you can still get a lot of oil offshore if you allow the permitting to go on. Yeah, I, I, the point I want, we, we're seeing this huge boom in oil and, and gas shell, and, and it's basically exist on non-federal yeah, land. So I just think slide put up on the screen again, that would be fantastic. If you 
look at the state of Colorado as it appears on the map that uh, is right there. You can see the state of Colorado. That red spot is in my district in northern Colorado. But there's tremendous opportunity for development in the gray spots. Uh, and a lot of that gray spot that you see in Colorado or the Rocky Mountain areas, uh, it's BLM land, it's U.S. Forest Service land, uh, they're unable to get permits through the BLM uh, because of various uh, bureaucracies. In fact, according to the Western Energy Alliance, over 100,000 jobs could be created in the Western United States primarily on those gray lands if the permitting delays were simply lifted. Over 100,000 jobs could be created in the western United States. That's not because all the development's taken place in the red areas or the pink areas. That's because the, the Bureau of Land Management and other agencies have uh, been so slow in their permitting that we can't get those permits through to create those kinds of jobs. So uh, I, I think you'd see a lot more red areas if we could actually get a government that was willing to allow us access to those resources in a responsible manner. And so I, for one, would like to see over 100,000 jobs being created in the western United States. Uh, but I'd also like to, to ask a couple of other questions, uh, pointing out that in that red area you see in northern Colorado right there, uh, because of that development that's taking place in that play, there was an article in the Greeley Tribune on January 17th that said, uh, the Greeley Tribune's the newspaper in northern Colorado that said, uh, Weld County rose 20 spots in, the, in a year to rank number 42 in the nation in job and wage growth. There was an article in the same newspaper, January 8th of 2013, that said Weld County wages, wage growth hits number five in the nation because of, uh, in great part, the energy development that's taking place in Colorado. So we can see the opportunities, and I believe it was Ms. Hutzler that talked about the amount of economic impact that we have seen. Uh, I think your statement, what was it again that you said about the trillion dollars over 30 years? Uh, how, how, what was the amount of money you said as a result of development? Uh, if we opened up new areas onshore and offshore to uh, development that we would get over the next 37 years, $14.4 trillion to the economy. And I believe the President's budget said that if we had, uh, and I'm going to get this, this number in the ballpark, uh, if we had 1 percent GDP growth over the next 10 years, we would generate around $2 billion or so in new revenues for the federal government. And so you can see the kind of activity that GDP growth uh, we would see, the kind of GDP growth we would see as a result of, of energy development across the country. Ms. Hutzler, uh, what, you mentioned the permitting delays on federal land. What do we need to do in order to alleviate those delays? We need to make the process more streamlined. We need to get rid of all the ta red tape and the delays and look at the states to see how they're doing it to, uh, to remove those delays.